Hello. This is Alexa Hampton. 52 weeks of design live. Today I am asking Laura Hi the incredible to join. Um, hi. I just washed my hair. So how's everybody doing? Hello. How are you? You've had a hair. Oh. No, it's just tied back. Yeah, it's still there. <laughs> tied back. How you doing? Good. It's so nice to see you again. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. Oh my gosh, thank you for I think you've got the situation backwards. <laughs> I think somehow you've misunderstood. It is you who is doing me a kindness because I would love to speak to you and I haven't spoken to you and I, you know, didn't speak to you that much because it was such a big night um, since the NYSID gala. Yeah, yeah. But I owe you, I mean, I said thank you that night, I think, but a bigger thank you because you were just so, like, I don't know, you were so friendly, you were so calm, you've done these things. I, so you were just like, you made me feel calm. So I appreciate I'm that. Super stressed. I... <laughs> I kept like getting confused by the script of the announcing stuff and Mike yeah. Bloomberg was right in front of me. Right. And I started having that also like that room is so crowded and it gets so hot yeah. and I started to have broadcast news swap swap. <laughs> so I'm glad I gave the impression of that. You did. You came but across as calm, cool and collected. But like I said, like you just made me feel because you were so smiley and happy and like welcoming. And I just I appreciated that so much because I was feeling like yeah, like, I was just like, oh, it's too much. It's but it, was, it was a wonderful night. And I appreciate that you uh, kind of took the edge off a little for me. So thank you. I, that makes me sound like booze. I love that. <laughs> well, uh, that, and, that and the wine helped, you know, but I didn't want to drink too much. So thank you for, you know, for your part in that. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, obviously, you have your bachelor's degree in business. Did you go to design school right after? No, not right after. I worked for a marketing company for about five years before I kind of was like, oh, I kind of need to try something different. So, um, and originally just thought, oh, I'll just do this little online program. And then I realized how ridiculous <laughs> that is because it's such a big, big industry. Like, I think that a lot of people don't really fully understand, like, how much we do. We do so much and people are like, oh, throw pillows and paint colors and yeah. yeah. There's so much more to it than that. So I was just like, I need to go back to school. I need to treat this like any other in industry where, you know, it needs, um, you know, needs more attention, needs more education. And so that's kind of why I ended up going back to school. And now more than ever, with yeah. like yeah. Her, because of, you know, all of the changes in, I know it just sounds like we're all banging the same drum over and over, but the supply chain has not yeah. completely righted itself. So it's a different conversation we are constantly having. Yeah. Um, how important do you, I'm, I'm assuming that the answer is very, but how important was, is your business degree? Was your business degree? Well, to be honest with you, only one client has ever asked me if I had a degree. And <laughs> for your- Oh, just for me? Um, I find it in, 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 invaluable because for me, um, you know, design, it's like art, you know, it's very subjective. So, you know, whether or not you like somebody else's design or it's your taste, all of that is very subjective. But in terms of something being well thought out and well intentioned and, you know, you know, have you put the thought into it? Is it good design? Even if you don't like it, like that's what school was so pivotal for me to, you know, to learn about was why are you doing the things that you're doing and what makes what you're doing special and good and interesting and important for the world? Like, what are you doing that's so great? And and I think that was that constant questioning of, and I still have that with me now is that I don't ever think that, oh, I just did a great project. So all the work I do is always going to be amazing. You know, it's like, you're only as, for me, I'm only as good as my last project, only as good as the last thing that I came up with. So I think that in school, they keep you on your toes. You know, it's like the constant critique and I hope, I, I mean, yes, we all look at the last thing we did, but there is a point where you can turn around and say, oh my God, look, there's a, there's a string. Yeah. <laughs> I need to do that more often. I think I don't. <laughs> I think sometimes I do forget to turn around and say, oh, that was pretty good. I think my, my concern with, um, with being, uh, you know, too, 
thoughtful about what I'm doing and thinking like, oh, look at all this great work I've done, is that I don't want to, um, I don't want to ever take that for granted or, um, or feel like, um, well, just because what I did before was great that I'll continue. You know, I feel like, I think it was Frank Geary who said, if I'm not scared about working on this project, that it's probably not going to be very good. Like there has to be some element of it that keeps you on your toes, that keeps you like learning something new and being fresh. And so um, that's sort of what I, that's what I aim for. And that's what I think school did for me is because school makes you question everything and it makes you, um, you know, really have, uh, have to think about what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so when you approach it, you know, your, your work does seem very intelligent in addition. Okay. <laughs> it looks um, precise and thoughtful and, um, you know, how much of your process is articulated to yourself? Um, well, I think that I am sort of, it's a process, but it's not always a process. I mean, there, there's the art side of it, and then there's the logistic side of it. Things need to fit, things need to be right, things need to be good for the client, things for us need to be sustainable. So there's all those kind of things that sort of go into it that are part of, uh, you know, the logistics of the design. And then there's the intuitive side of it, of like what feels right in the space, what is what what feels right for the client from the vibe that you're kind of getting from them with like there, there's so much more to it that's sort of hard to put into words and I think that's why you know school shouldn't be the end of it school shouldn't be the end of your design education and your learning like for me every single project is different every single project is new and I try to treat it that way so that I do have like a baseline of things. We have to do a floor plan, we have to do a furniture plan, we have to do all our drawings and we have to know what we're talking about. Um, and we have to get to know the client, we have to you know, work with the architect and that sort of thing. But beyond that, that special thing that only we can do for the space um, and make it you know, thoughtful and intentioned and really perfect for that specific client. I like to, I like to ask myself, could anybody live in this house? Could any of our clients live in this house? Or is this you know, is this specific for them? And I, and I kind of feel that way about a lot of the things that we do is like, no, that's just kind of for them, you know? And then I think it's kind of special. And I think that's sort of what they respond to is it, you know, this is for us, you know? Yeah. And they get a, they get buy-in ownership, they, and pride. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I wanted to add, Oh, I know Billy Baldwin, if you could have any decorator to your house, it would be Billy Baldwin living or dead. Um, <laughs> Who else are some of your, like, who, from from where do you draw lots of inspiration? I know nature, so I'm not even, like, I'm taking yeah, that. Sure, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, inspiration. I think, I, you know, I draw inspiration. I think oh, Florence behind you? Do I have what? Is that oh, travel. Travel. Yeah. Inspiration from a lot of travel. Yeah, no, I have this whole, like, wall of, like, places that we go to. Um, I like to be reminded of that all the time. We do still travel now that we have kids. We're not like, oh, we just stop traveling because we have children. Um, but certainly, you know, it's nice to um, look back on what we've done. But travel would be a huge inspiration for me. I'm actually going to Italy on Sunday, which I'm super excited about. I've been, like, in, like, 14 or 15 years. So um, very exciting for that. Um, I, I get inspiration from all kinds of places. I get inspiration from furniture design and from, um, you know, people in other industries as well. I mean, there's certainly, yeah. you know, Instagram is great. You see all these other designers doing, you know, amazing things and that's really cool. But honestly, I look anywhere, you know, I've, I've got this stack of records um, sitting next to me and I'm, I'm, I like to leave it out because I like to see all the different, the graphic design and, and the artistry that goes into just designing like the, co the cover of like a vinyl record, you know, the, the yeah, thought sure. and effort that goes into that. So um, I'm, I'm kind of drawn to, um, anything that sort of speaks to me. So, and I think in that way, design is sort of an art form, right? Because it should have an emotional connection for you. And that's what I try to make sure our, our designs are having an emotional connection for our clients. How do you tease out, I mean, I know we all obviously are asking our clients questions, but what questions or what, what source of information allows you to elicit the most information about them. Like I don't actually look at the, what people are wearing. I know that that people say look in your clients' closets. You know, I don't believe that because my my closet's like, you know, black. Right. right. I, I hope that nobody would look in my closet and then decorate for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. 
Um, yeah. So what what are the what are the questions? And I would love to know this truly, mm. so I could start asking them. Like, <laughs> what are the questions that you think are the best ones that really yeah give the real answers? Well, for me, um, I you know I'll say on paper, oh you know, look in your closet, and we have the Pinterest boards, and everybody obviously shows us all images of where they've been and traveled. You know, where have you traveled to, and where did how did you like that trip, and what drew you to that, and that sort of thing. It's really more about what that client tells me is how they want to feel in the space, mm -hmm. and because ultimately they like a lot of things and what they like just because they like okay you know you ask them what colors do like I, I like blue and i don't like warm colors and oh you know that doesn't mean anything at least to me because a room can be exactly the opposite of what you thought you would ever like right and so because i have a friend who is great at style like she's a fantastic um she's always up to date on all the fashion and everything and she'll um she'll go shopping with me and be like try this on and i'm like no it looks horrible on the hanger i'm like that is not me that doesn't who 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 do you think i am i'm not gonna wear it. and then she'll i'll put it on because you know because otherwise she won't stop talking about it. so i'll put it on and i'm like oh my god i look amazing and it's something that i never would have ever tried and she can like she's in tune with that you know and so i kind of look at what we do in a similar way that we have to be the ones to sort of curate the space on their behalf and so they can tell us all kinds of things but um i kind of ask them how they want to feel in the space what sort of entertaining they might be doing i ask them all the logistical kinds of questions you know their kids and all that sort of stuff but then i just kind of i think a lot of it is intuitive is just looking at that person and, and understanding how they live and because style wise, a lot of things can work, right? Um, right. They go into, but I mean, you know, obviously if they say, I don't like wicker, then obviously we would never use wicker, but there's specific things like that. But in terms of how they actually, like we had a project where our client said, I just want a blank palette for artwork. I want to be able to start my own new um, collection of artwork. I want it to be all modern and I want it to feel, um, you know, like representative of this area and that sort of thing. And so that was one of the main things that we sort of pulled from is that we were, we were making a beautiful space that wouldn't overshadow artwork, right? And so it was speaking to the architecture a lot rather than having like tons of patterns and color everywhere. We created a very neutral sort of backdrop for all this artwork and for them to live in this space, right? So I, I think Billy Baldwin said that too, is that like the room should make the people look good, right? And make the lifestyle look good, which I think is like, so cool because that's not really something that you necessarily always think about you're thinking about what it looks like on instagram and you're looking at what does this room look like without people in it but i always try to think what does a room look like with people in it with people using the space um what are some of the so it's interesting back in the day way back in the day i think of people entertaining far more than they do now obviously less so recently for for obvious reasons um but when people say they want to entertain a lot what does that i know what that meant i i mean i know what that means for me and mostly i mean i don't entertain a lot but it means i want it to look good and like entertainment ready you know without a big song and dance i want okay. it to look ready to receive um but you know, we live so differently now. So when somebody says they want to entertain these days, how do you take that? I take I it mean, besides So yeah, right. <laughs> Definitely easily accessible booze. Um, I take it to mean that the space needs to be like, well, like you were saying, easily ready to, to present, you know, and also enough seating and that it feels like you can have a really good traffic flow through the space, right? So however your seating is arranged, like I think a lot of it is like that space planning, however the seating is arranged, that people can get up and move around, that they want to just sort of um, explore the room. And so how are your guests going to um, experience the space? Do they walk in and then that's it? They understand the entire space at a glance? Or do they, you know, would they maybe be mingling and walking around? And are there different places for them to sort of stop and put a drink down and talk with somebody or sit down and have an intimate conversation? Does everybody have to be part of the big conversation all the time? Or can you kind of yeah. walk off to a different space and have like a small conversation? Um, yeah. You know, can you have a big sit down meal or a smaller space and sort of making the room feel a little bit um, or the whole house feel modular and usable in different ways. And so, yeah, that's sort of how I 
would think about that. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, just as you say that, that's probably why I hate chandeliers in living rooms. Um, I love them in a dining room. And I mean, I love them as an object. Yeah. I don't like how they're anchors. Mm -hmm. you know, they just kind right. of stop all the action. Right. What's your favorite room to decorate? Oh, that question's so difficult because it's like it's like what child is your favorite child, and they're all different, and they're all they all have their challenges, and they all have. Yeah, their I mean, you like, can say I don't have one. I'll well, have you know, I, I love I do love living rooms. I also love kitchens. Um, kitchens I love because they are such a living space, even though um, and they're a functional space at the same time. So I kind of love the idea of making a space where the client's going to be like, oh my god. I can't believe this is right here at my fingertips. This is perfect. I'm so glad that this happened. Like they can just do what they need to do. And we have created this wonderful environment for them to do what they want to do, which ultimately is just cook, right? They don't want to be, you know, doing anything else in there. They're just cooking and, and it may be entertaining as well. So creating a space that can be functional and also beautiful at the same time, I think is, is a challenge, but I think it's, um, it's very rewarding on the back end. Um, were you raised loving design? Did your parents love design? Were you dragged to museums? Where, where's this all coming? <laughs> well, we did used to, so I'm, I'm from England originally. And so we would go back to England um, in the I summers. That. Did I know Sorry. that? I don't know. They kind of announced it that night. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if they did or not, honestly. Um, I am though originally, yeah. I moved over here when I was a kid though. That's so why my accent's not really much. Where in England? Um, uh, Northern England. Because my yeah. daughter uh, is, is in York. Oh, it's so funny. Yeah, so like an hour from York. Yeah, <laughs> but near Manchester, sort of in between Manchester and York. Yeah. Um, but it's a little tiny, you know, uh, town. It's not even a city. Little town about half an hour outside of Manchester. Um, but anyway, so we used to go back in the summers and we would travel a lot, uh, going to see castles and cathedrals and all this sort of stuff. And um, I wouldn't necessarily, I don't know if that's necessarily like a direct route for my love of design, but it certainly made me appreciate environments a lot more. My dad was always very much into architecture. He'd always said that if he didn't do what he ended, he was in the British Navy for a while and then, um, but he was like, he's always loved architecture. Um, so I guess just an appreciation of shape and form and our environments has always sort of been there from that. I think living in historical settings, um, obviously the older we get as, as a country, we become historical. Yeah. But, um, but I, I think like my nephew who grew up in Rome, I, and just being able to look around and see that, that baseline of incredible beauty and design all the time are you guys being in northern England and, and seeing like the beautiful hedges and the yeah. planning and the squares and the and I mean it does it does kind of give you a center of gravity about beauty yeah Maybe. and it also lets you know um you know some parameters around good design right because all of that stuff you know it wasn't built some some of it was built, you know, you know, cheaply, I, I assume, like trying to save money. I'm sure not all of it was was expensively done. But even when it was inexpensively done, there were still um, thoughtfulness behind it and craftsmanship behind it. Like the house that we had in England, which is exactly the same as my, my we used to live next door to my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And so they had the same house as we have, which is like a terrace front house and uh, four story Victorian. And so I, one of the things that I always, always loved about my grandparents' house and our house at the time was that you could stand on the first floor and see all the way up to the third floor through the banister, you know, which I thought was so cool. I mean, for a kid, obviously it's fun because you get to see all the way down the stairs, but it's just one of those little moments where you're like, that is just, it just makes it feel so light and open and it just is an appreciation of the whole house at once. It's just, you know, such an attention to detail and to space planning and to the idea of sort of, you know, that gorgeous view of seeing all the way up the stairs at the same time. I love it. It's like the main, the main artery. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm wondering. Food delivery? <laughs> no, I was wondering if that was Percy, our dog, has gone to the groomer. And oh. I, when he comes back, he's going to attack and it's going yeah. to be well, usually my cat gets into all of our Zoom calls or lives or anything like that. And she's just sitting here in the sunshine and she's like being very chill. But usually she's like here and there's like a tail. Yeah. You know, push her away. 
That's all, yeah. Instead of looking at decorating Instagram these days, I just watch like cat and dog and otter videos. And I yeah. even follow a turtle. A, a oh, turtle. yeah. <laughs> I've lost my mind. Um, but uh, no, what I wanted to ask you, okay, so you're very involved in sustainability and you are an ambassador for sustainable, what's the, what's the Permanent organization? Permanent Council. The Sustainable Permanent. Council, yeah. Um, and Baltimore is just the perfect place to be in a sustainable movement. I mean, at least insofar as recycling of gorgeous architecture is concerned. Yes. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I'm on um, the train and going through Baltimore or arriving in Baltimore and I see the row houses abandoned or otherwise. I'm, I'm always like overwhelmed by their beauty. Yeah. I, you involved in organizations where you can like take pieces of that architecture and revive them like if they can't be used in certain you know like like an urban archaeology or architectural artifacts um what's that seem like in baltimore and is it vibrant yes it is so there's this place downtown um in baltimore called second chance and they <laughs> are fantastic. They actually, um, they use not only old building materials and furniture and that sort of thing, but they also, it's also called, it's like they call Second Chance also because a lot of their employees are, uh, well, all of their employees are uh, people who might have trouble finding, you know, conventional jobs. And so they kind of give them a second chance too. And so it's just a fantastic location. And so we get like all kinds of cool stuff from there. But we actually recently worked on a project um, renovating and restoring an old house, uh, a row house in Marble Hill, which is a historically black neighborhood and literally had marble steps on all the fronts um, of, of all the houses. So it's, re it's really cool. They're in a rainstorm, but gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so we do that. And then we also work with a local um, woodworker uh, who makes all their furniture and countertops and that sort of thing only from naturally fallen wood. So naturally fallen trees from all of Maryland. So it's really cool because like we'll have fr custom furniture made from them. We do it quite a bit with them and we'll say, you know, to our client, hey, this whole desk was made from one naturally fallen tree, which is really awesome. So naturally fallen, meaning that, you know, it wasn't chopped down to be made into a desk. It fell down naturally or it was taken down because it was, uh, you know, in the way of a sidewalk <laughs> or some other type of thing. But it, it wasn't just taken down to be made into furniture. Yeah. Yeah. I, I plan to naturally fall down myself. But unlike those trees, I do not want to be. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I really love Baltimore. I wish I knew it better. It's a, I have worked there, but it's so it feels very sprawling to me. It feels huge. Yeah. Oh, huge. It is. It is pretty big. Um, there's a lot of different neighborhoods, um, and and all are kind of like they have their own little sort of vibe going on, which is kind of fun. Um, and then there's Baltimore County. We're actually in, in the county of uh, in Baltimore County, so we're like not downtown. We're a bit more suburban, but we're very close. The, the nice thing about Maryland is that it's it's not a very big state, so you can get to DC in 45 minutes. I can get up to New York on a train in like two and a half hours. So we're in a really nice sort of central location. We do a lot of projects on the Eastern Shore as well in the Chesapeake Bay. So um, we're in a pretty central location for a lot of projects, which is nice. Um, do you? do you want to expand everywhere? I mean, like you have no limit, right? You, <laughs> said, no, we do do projects out of state. Yeah. But if somebody said you want to do my place in Paris or whatever, you'd be getting Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. Who, who said that? <laughs> but said that like, no, know, I'd love that. I would love to do anything. Yeah. Sense, but you're everywhere. Yeah. Now we have a project in Las Vegas. We have another project in Miami. So we do have, we do have projects out of state. Um, they're all, those clients also have a home here. So it's not like somebody random found us and then was like, Hey, come here. It, they, they're like a second or third home for other clients that we already have. So, but yeah, if they, you know, somebody wanted us to work in, I don't know, anywhere. Yeah. I love traveling. So I'm like, let's go. Where do we want to build a house? <laughs> when did you open the studio? Um, 2016. 2016. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then we opened our shop in 2018. 2018? Yeah, 2018. Hey, about that. You, it was Sorry? 
tell me about that. Oh, so our shop is called Domain by Laura Hodges Studio. And um, it's just a tiny little shop. We had um, the studio space and then we had these big picture windows at the front. So we're like, oh, we could turn like the front half of the building into a shop because why not? Um, like I love, who's sorry? Who's we? Oh, my husband and I. So I, I work with my husband, Tim. And oh, I didn't know that. He <laughs> totally got up at the podium. Who's <laughs> Tim? I know, I know. He um, as it should be. <laughs> he he does like the other half of the business. I do all the design. He does the 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 rest of it. You know, like the business side of things. We we joke and say that he's our IT department and our HR department and our accounting department. Like all the things. So it's great. Um, I don't think I met Tim. Is Tim? T you know, like wait, what is the name of the couple on TV that do the, the, the fun program that we all, that everyone watched? And oh, everyone, um, um, Gaines, the Gaines is Chip and Gerard yeah. Gaines. Yeah, so he doesn't do any, no, he's not a contract. No, no, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I, um, I, I thought it was interesting. Once somebody said to me um, that, you know, Joanna Gaines was amazing, but that the secret sauce was, as far as watching television was concerned. Yeah. Yeah. One chip that you can find lots of talented people, but it was, you know, that yeah. it was the sort of irreplaceable ingredient that I, I thought was such a, an interesting reflection. So I'm just, I'm of course in my mind seeing you on TV with Tim, <laughs> he, as he actually is your age of heart. But um, well, he's 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 got a he's got a very unique sense of humor, which um, I think is amazing, and I love. And we like have like moved it on to our children as well, so we all have the same sense of humor now, which works quite well. Um, I don't know if you. Which I don't is know. what? Sorry. Which is what? What? Oh, is just very dry, very oh. dry. Like he'll say something, you're like, "What did you just say?" You know, and you realize like he he just nothing. I can't do anything without him. Like catching it you know what I mean like I can't just say something that sounds a little out of character or do something like he will absolutely call me out on like anything I do um which but I do the same thing to him and we do the same thing to our kids and our kids do it to us so it's just like a constant sort of like little jabs that um it makes it makes life more fun though <laughs> you can't without, take yourself too seriously yeah without humor it's terrible but um how old are your kids they are nine and eleven which is scary to think yeah, about. Yeah, driving straight into where I am, which is yeah, sanity. Well, and Tim is 6'5", so our 11-year-old is 5'5", five, five, I think. So he's like the height of like some adults, like oh, yeah. adults. Cool. So he's like eye contact. And so you have to, I have to remind myself that he's only 11 because I'm like almost eye level with him. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I remember going to nightclubs at 12, but that's a different. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I spent a lot of time in England, and in England they don't care. Yeah, boys and girls are very different animals. Though. Yeah. Um, so what? I wonder what they think of their parents working together. I mean, are they interested in design? I mean, with the two of you working together, they must hear it all the time. They do. We try to limit it, you know, like over the dinner table kind of thing. But um, we do end up talking about this stuff a lot. And you know, obviously, I, I have to. I I don't. I, I do try to limit my work day to. And I actually really don't start working until they leave for school. And then, you know, when they come home, I'm probably still at work for like another hour or two. But they do hear us talking about it, obviously, a decent amount. Um, I think that they like it, honestly. They both want to work in the shop when they get older. Uh, when they're old enough. Like they keep asking when they can start working there. And they tell all their friends and like, you know, we'll do like a career day at their school. And so they're always excited about that. Like, I think a lot of um, their school likes to talk to us because you know, the like entrepreneurial side of things and somebody having their own business and talking about that. Stuff. And that you're together. That's yeah, a very yeah, exciting yeah. thing. That well, I would say, are... like, I think a lot of people are like, oh, how do you work with your spouse? That sounds crazy. But we kind of treat it as like our third child, you know, and like you don't argue in front of your kids and you try not to, you know. You don't? <laughs> well, you try not to. <laughs> That's the reason. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, if we can if we can do that together, it kind of, it makes life easier, honestly, with the kids, because then we each know each other's schedules all day long. And he knows, okay, you know, Laura's doing a live right now. So if the kids are coming home, he's like, just text me when you're done so that I don't, you know, walk in. You right. Know, and and so. you're, not, you're not doing the same things at all, which so you're not yeah. 
hand in hand every minute. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely are like in our own lanes and he's like texting me about like accounting stuff. And we, we definitely work together on like the business growth. So for instance, like two doors down from domain right now, we're sort of working on expanding our studio space there. And then we're going to put a small cafe in the front. And so we work on all those things together. Um, but in terms of the design, it's like, I'll do the design with our team. And then he does um, the, everything else. <laughs> How big is the team? So we have uh, a junior designer, an assistant designer. We have somebody who runs the shop. And then we also have somebody who helps with like um, all everything else, like social media, creative stuff, graphic design, and all that kind of good right. stuff. Um, that's, I, I, I forget who told me this, but somebody once um, told me that they had been a part of a group that had studied like the perfect size for a for a design company and that that, that was seven. Oh, okay well, well i think we're at six <laughs> but it works really well it, yeah it is a good size yeah i didn't hear the any of the rationale but i yeah. i remember the number ever yeah um how with the so i find the notion of having a store very foreign Mm. You know, like that stresses me out thinking about it. What led you to well, do that? Well, I, I, to, be, to be fair, I, I, Tim and I started the store together, but we immediately were like, we need to hire somebody. So Kathy, uh, she is our boutique manager and she runs the shop. And so I kind of curated like what we carry and we try to have the shop a reflection of right. our design aesthetic so that you don't walk in there and say like, why is this here, you know? Right. Um, and so if you walk- Why are there the porcelain door, dolls? Uh-huh. <laughs> <spinning face. laughs> but I try to think about that with every purchase. I think, would, would our clients want this item? And even if it's like a bamboo toothbrush, would I put this in our client's home? Like, cause we have some lifestyle stuff like deodorant cream and tea and, you know, but everything kind of makes sense with like uh, how, honestly, I would buy everything in the shop. So worst case scenario, I will buy everything and we'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what do you do about inventory? What do you mean? Like, do you have to stock a ton of stuff or is it yeah. do you go into the shop and, you know, as things are bought, you replace things? Like, so it's not very big. It's like 600 square feet. It's pretty small. And so, but we also do a lot of our sales online. Um, right, we right. took the store online and then we, we just did that because we were getting some national exposure and we're like, Oh, we should make sure that people can find us online. And then we kind of took off. So that was really great. But then we're like, uh Oh, how much inventory do we need to carry? Because we always used to carry like three of each thing. <laughs> because right. The shop is so small. So now we do have a little bit more of a back stock so that we can accommodate online orders and that sort of thing. But still, we're still small. We're not necessarily aiming to be like, you know, 50 million stores, you know, right nationwide or anything we also like to just carry things that are sustainable fair trade and if possible made locally so like all of our candles are made locally all of our artwork is original and local and like we have chopping boards from that place i was telling you about that makes you know things naturally fell tree, fell trees so we don't just carry stuff that you could find at bloomingdale's or that you would find you know on a clear racket home goods you know like you're not going to find this stuff um just anywhere it is special curated things that we're having yeah. Either we actually have things made, because we do have some things that I've designed as well, which yeah. is pretty cool. Um, so, Good. Give me an example. Oh, so, well, for instance, like there's a company that makes baskets and they have all these artisans in Uganda and Rwanda and they asked me if I'd like to design my own collection. And so we do have um, like uh, placemats and coasters mm -hmm. and wall hangings and that sort of thing. They're all, um, they're all woven. And so I designed a collection of those. And then we used to have these vases. There. Did you get to go? Oh gosh, I would have loved to have done that, but no, I didn't, unfortunately. Maybe well, that, that gets to be yeah, that would be awesome. on the list. Yeah. I would um, love to. How do you, with the artwork, so, you know, we all always need sources of artwork. We need yeah. to, you know, it's so hard to be knowledgeable about emerging artists. I mean, unless you're in the art world. Mm -hmm. so, how do you go about finding, are these friends? Are you just, are you on the art scene? Or the name of the store is Domain. Mm -hmm. what, what's your domain name? <laughs> it's Domain by Laura Hodges Studio. Okay. So you can, and you can link back and forth between our um, domain website and Laura Hodges Studio. So if you're on Laura Hodges Studio, just click Domain and it'll take you over there. We just have them separate. 
Um, so, so in terms of artwork though, we like, so a lot of the artists, when we first opened up, a lot of artists came to us and then we were also looking for artists as well. So it's kind of like a two way street. Um, we've kind of, we, we, again, it's not a very big shop. So as artists keep coming to us, we kind of have to be very, very particular about who we carry. Cause I do not want it to be that we just like are constantly cycling through artists. We want to maintain that loyal sort of relationship. We also ask our clients for commissioned pieces a lot, right? So we have a couple of our um, artists that can just paint like anything that we want, right? So we'll say, oh, we have a dining room space and we need something that's this big and this yeah. is the type of thing that a client might be interested in. Is it abstract? Is it more figurative and that sort of thing? And then um, we may even set them up directly with the client and then they can sort of, you know, work through that together. So it kind of depends on the situation, but it gives us a lot of flexibility to do custom artwork, commissioned pieces specifically for them. Um, and then we also have relationships with bigger galleries as well. Um, the pieces that we have in the shop are all uh, consignment. So, you know, they can easily come back and pick something up and take it to a show or bring us new pieces and we kind of can cycle through them pretty well. So that's nice. Right. That's a, and uh, in my opinion, that's a huge, a huge addition to having a shop because artwork for, for the reasons I said, like, it's just so hard to find. I mean, I know it's out there. It's yeah. hard to take the time to find it. And there's so much to see. And, you know, obviously, given that you are curating, it, it does, you know, and I've got no, no problem with things that are quote unquote decorative. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's still it's artistic to me. Sure. You know, I don't think decorative, obviously, is the dirty word that you know, maybe a, another gallerist would, would think it. Yeah, would. well, we have, we, a lot of it is, is original. Most of it is original, but we do have some prints as well that are a more accessible price point. And then, you know, if we have something that's original and our client doesn't have that, you know, because a client may have the budget for all the furnishings and to build the house, but they may not necessarily value art in yeah. that way to kind of put out even more of a budget for that. So we sometimes still need to have like a more accessible price point, even if the house is amazing, they still want to do um, something a little easier on the pocketbook for artwork. Yeah. So. And if they're dipping their toe in, I mean, that could, who knows where that could lead. Yeah. So setting aside uh, a budget, I mean, that could go from zero to infinity. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to, it's hard to, it's, you know, what's it to you? Yeah. What is the value to you? Right. Um, so yeah, that client that you worked for, who for whom you made the interiors in support of their oncoming collection, um, how old are they? They are, if they're not watching, I hope, I think that they're in the mid fifties. <laughs> no, I asked because, um, you know, if you're, if you're setting up a place in order to absorb a yeah. collection, you obviously it has to look good before the collection is, done yes but you also have to give yourself the time to find and collect. yes you can't exactly. add water and well they had plenty of time <laughs> because yes, yes, yes. it was a good renovation so they started sourcing artwork right away and once we had the design boards ready to go and they knew what the space was going to look like and i said okay you know because they would come up to new york for instance and then they would be looking for pieces and then I'd, they'd say how about this and i'm like well we can't do that because it's like there's really no place to put it like there's that just doesn't legit like it's wonderful and i'm all for buying pieces that speak to you and that you have an emotional reaction to but it still needs to fit somewhere right so you're going to make sure there's space for it, yeah. 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 Um, what are you, what are, oh, I'm just hearing somebody screaming in the house. <laughs> what are your your plans for like the next five, 10 years? Do, it, does the store get bigger? Does it say as it is? A and the design, I mean, are they growing hand in hand? Like what what's happening? Because you're getting tons of attention. You know, I'm seeing your work everywhere. It's thrilling. What do you, uh, where do you want to take it? Um, well, we are opening this again. We always do things in a small way, I guess, at first, just to kind of test the waters. But we are opening a small cafe probably early next year, mid next year, kind of depends on how the permit process goes with the building. But anyway, that's our next step. Um, I really would love to be so we just do design a lot of furniture for our clients homes, but those are all sort of like one offs. And so I'd love to have a furniture collection, wallpaper collection, lighting, I mean, anything really, because yeah. every time 
looking for things. I'm always like, I want to be designing, not just sourcing. You know, I want to be designing specific pieces that are from my brain or from inspiration or something like that, because that to me is is more interesting than just like, oh, this lamp looks great. Like I'd love to actually design a lamp for yeah. the space or just have a different vision. I have a different vision for like lighting and furniture and that sort of stuff. And I, I would love to be able to kind of have, have that come to life more so than just in one person's house. I love that too, but I, I love the idea of having, and I would love for it to be sustainable and I would love for it to be, uh, you know, a certain price point is- well, Hold on a second. Yeah, go ahead. We have to define our terms here. If you yeah. want to do a furniture line that's sustainable, what does that mean? So it means that whoever is making it is sourcing their wood responsibly. And that means that they are tracking it and they have full transparency with exactly where it's coming from. So hopefully they're either sourcing it from rapidly renewable forests or right. they're sourcing it from naturally felled trees, or they're, even if they are, you know, growing new trees, uh, you know, from a new growth forest that they are able to then plant more trees so mm -hmm. that there's some transparency there. I think a lot of the times it's just the lack of transparency. You don't know where something's coming from that right. they're using, um, you know, low VOCs and that the, that the product itself is not off gassing in somebody's home and that the fabric is well made and that the actual piece of furniture is really well made and that the people who are making it are getting paid fairly right at the yeah. right price point <laughs> well and that was the other side well, of it, right whatever it's, that it's, means how do you whatever that means because if you and there may be good. i've always thought that there could be two levels right that there can be the level where the price is not as, as big of a deal that there's a client for that, right? But then, you know, the more accessible, I don't think that we should be throwing out the window, the sustainability and the health and wellness of the person who's buying it in order to get to a more accessible price point. And we shouldn't be making throwaway furniture so that it's a, a more accessible price point. Like the furniture should still, it should, it should be an investment. It shouldn't be something that you just yeah. buy on a, on a whim. And then you're like, well, I'll just throw it away when it breaks. You know, like I wouldn't want my furniture in a clearance bin. I wouldn't want, you know, something that I had designed to be on like the red line shelf because it's chipping and breaking and nobody right. wants it anymore. So I would still want whatever we did. And that's the hard part is aligning our values and interests and design style with a larger manufacturer who's willing to do that um, because yeah. at the end of the day the price point has to be there and that's the difficulty so um there's Lose also that. i have i've definitely in my lifetime especially online watched conversations about importation yeah seen people get upset at things being made elsewhere than america and being imported and I always feel like, um, you know, I'd hate to say anything controversial um, because I'm a happy person. I just want to spread ha happy yeah, thoughts. But I think there is a way to to be a citizen of where you're from and a citizen, a larger citizen. You know, to you can um, you can make things in America or wherever it is you're from in such a way that the people who are making it are, are, are earning a living wage. And you can also make things in other places with other people who are wonderful human beings. And then if there is a savings, you are giving something at a savings available where you back where you are again. So, yeah. you know, the, I'm, I'm less, you know, of course, I want everyone to, to flourish and do well, but sometimes that means it's not always in one location. Yeah, well, I, I completely agree with that. I think the global trade is very important. I don't think that every single thing needs to be made in America. And yeah. honestly, there are like that's really going to limit your design style too, right? Because they're not making all of the different styles that are available throughout the world and all the different crafts and all the different cultural pieces are not going to be made in Vermont, right? I mean, there's a million wonderful women. Yeah. And Vermont. not everyone can afford that piece that is made in Vermont by loving right. hands, people who are right, whatever. But doing. what I would say is that those people, those those pieces that are made overseas, <laughs> what kind of dog is it? He's a Bichon poodle. Oh, that's adorable. <laughs> um, so, okay, the people who are yeah building these things overseas. Yeah. So if if a piece is made, being made overseas, I would just say. I would love it if that piece would have some transparency. How much is that? I don't need to know how much that money 
that person is yeah. making. You want to feel good. I just want to make that, sure that, that they are good. not suffering so that I can have a piece of cheap furniture, that they can still live a, a good life and, and feed their family and pay their mortgage and that sort of thing. And if something's at a certain price point, you can look at it and be like, okay, so in order for me to pay a hundred dollars for this thing that should be, you know, $500 or a thousand dollars, somebody had to suffer somewhere along the line of this piece of furniture being made. Somebody got a raw deal so that I can get it for a hundred bucks, yeah. right? Which is a, a great price for whatever this thing is. But you're like, but why is it so right? Big? At what cost? Yeah. And who, well, Value and who, yeah. Who is price versus so. cost? Yeah. Yeah. And then also if you think about the other side of it, if it is it being made well, uh, like the full sort of cradle to cradle idea of making something and then knowing that it's not going to end up in a landfill. What can it be taken apart and made into something else? Is it so good quality that you can pass it on to your neighbor, your friend, your child? Can somebody buy it from you? Or is it just a piece of crap that's going to end up in the landfill at some point? But it was only a hundred bucks, so who cares? Um, I, I think what we should care. And I think we should be thinking about the life cycle of things and making sure that um, you know, we're doing our part, especially as designers, we have so much influence over that. Like we can really sort of curate, not just a beautiful collection, but a responsible and a sustainable collection that yeah. our clients can um, appreciate. Um, and also promote uh, cultures that are making unique things. So whether I mean, absolutely that's think, it, yes. and a beautiful yeah. embroidery from somewhere else, um, keeping that legacy alive because people who um you know there are certain skills that get lost yeah and we don't want them to get lost yeah absolutely i mean they're getting lost even in this country you know um and that's why it's, it's sort of a bummer because when as these things do get lost those things those items then become much more expensive and then it's sort of like this uh difficult situation that you get stuck in you say well i really want something that's really well made but really well made things now are really expensive because nobody yeah. can do that anymore because that trade that craft is sort of you know in a dying industry so um i'm all for yeah, learning um we just know, have to like even be more thinking. yeah I think like we're we're in an ethical moment in time. Yeah. You know, people yeah. do care. Um, you know, they do care, or or they they want to feel good about choices. If they can feel good about something, they'd prefer to feel good about it. Yeah, absolutely. It's not the driving force. I found that sustainability and you know fair trade is certainly not the driving force behind a purchase, but it will make the person feel better about it. So if you have two items, one is well made and sustainable, fair trade, and one looks exactly the same and isn't, people will buy the one that is, even if it's like, I think the 10% 10, 10 threshold of it being a little bit more expensive is like the most that somebody will on average pay more for that um, of the same item. Which is, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we, this, this could, we could go right down this rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, and like, you know, in a world where religion play, plays less of a role, of course, ethics than, you know, ethical practices and general morality then take up more headspace. You know, if I'm not tithing something or going to a church and doing yeah rituals i want other things that i do in my life to 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 fill that okay see so it got really weird really quick <laughs> <laughs> so anyway no but i think i think it's really important to be uh, for us to be good stewards of the world right good stewards of good design and making sure like if we're out there saying hey buy all new furniture for your beautiful new house why not just be all <laughs> which we are right which is that's that's literally our job and so i think it's just an, it's an extra layer of making sure that your design is not only like beautiful but that it's good like i you know i, I have a little catchphrase like um good design is sustainable right because it will last long a long time it will last longer than something that is um, poorly made or not well thought out or well intentioned because to me sustainability isn't just about things being made of you know uh FSC certified wood, right? I mean, that doesn't in and of itself make it sustainable because if it's not a good product, it's going to fall apart. And then all that wood is just going to sit in a landfill somewhere being sustainable. So um, it's, or, good you know, I mean, not being, <laughs> it's horrible because it's going to fall apart. So it's not just about that. It's, it's also, you could just buy something locally that is vintage 
and you're being sustainable, right? So, because you're not buying anything new, there's, there's no new transportation costs, there's no new production costs, there's no material being wasted, and it's gonna be, you're already using something that already exists. So we start a lot of our design um, process with vintage. What can we keep from what the client already has? What can we source vintage, antique? And you start with what already exists, right? We can buy, we can get building materials, chandeliers, lighting, furniture, rugs, all that kind of stuff um, that already exists. And then we think, okay, if we have to buy something new, where is it coming from? Who's making it? How far is it traveling? What's it made of? And again, to me, that's just another layer of that thoughtfulness that goes into really good yeah. design. So. And, and makes a good anything. Yeah. You know, thoughtfulness yeah. and thinking and good choices. Like you sprinkle in a few good choices every single day, you know, Yes. And you don't have to be doing all of it. Right. And so another little like takeaway is that we can all do a little bit. We nobody has to do it perfectly. Right. We can all be imperfectly sustainable so that we can all do our part. Um, a few of us doing it perfectly is not going to help yeah. all that much. Right. We all have to just pay attention and do a little bit that we can do. And on every project, you could be doing a little bit more, you know, on every project, you could just think about it a little bit, even just thinking about it puts you in a different headspace. and makes you make different choices. Yeah. And, and um, that, and that's just the other meaning of sustainability. Can you sustain the habit? Yes. If, if you can only, if, if the drive to being perfect makes you just give up, yeah, and don't do that. Then Please not, don't. You know, they're just be driven to be. It can a be very back. overwhelming, and you can feel like a tiny speck. And you can watch these things on Netflix that tell you that no matter what we do, we as people are not going to make any difference. It's really the big companies that have to make the change, which is absolutely true. But again, we have that buying power to then tell the big companies this is what we want, right? And in your own small way, in your own house, you can you know stop using paper towels and use like a deodorant cream, and you can use you know, try to use sustainable stuff inside your house, but then also make those buying choices that are telling the big companies, this is what we want, right? right. So right. it's, you can kind of, the, the big companies are driven by demand, right? So if we're all demanding certain way of, um, of, of you know, fabricating something yeah. or transparency and asking those questions, whenever I go to High Point, I think all the vendors are like, oh, here she comes. Because I always ask them, where things are made, yeah. right? And it, hopefully they can tell me and who is making it. And I always get into those conversations with, um, you know, uh, with the actual people in the showroom about the fabrication of everything. Cause that's what I really want to be able to explain to our clients. And I want to know it for myself as well. Um, wow, that feels like a perfect place to just stop because I'm gonna go into some weird thing again. If <laughs> um, are you going to- Am I going where? To High Point. Oh, of course, yes, yes. So. So we need to work on getting you a furniture line. Yes, please. And it could, it could, given, given your goals, or even, and it embodies your philosophy of starting small and testing the waters, it could begin a small batch as a very rare and fabulous thing that would justify the cost that perhaps it would need to be so that you could check off the boxes of these important things. Um, and it could be in a, in a, it could be a, another mass market company's first foray into this. This could be yes. like a banner moment for them where they try to see what they could do. Yeah, and that's, that's I mean, that's actually interesting that you mentioned that because that was one of my thoughts is that you could have a bigger company who maybe has like a special line that is this. Yeah, you know, and that they don't have to transfer your entire company over and change or all of it. that everything they do is yeah, yeah. But again, it's that it's that making a small right. step in the right direction. And you know, we have instead of this this collection that is by you know a designer, it is beautiful in its own right. But you know, maybe we're making it a little bit differently too, right? And so, you know, yeah, like, that, yeah. not give up taking airplanes mm -hmm. to get to Italy. I hope yeah. I'm not going by boat. But <laughs> if you are airplane you try to you know there are other choices and other aspects of your life like i i got the dirtiest look actually she told me i was evil <laughs> <laughs> because i picked up a i was at my deli my corner deli and i i picked up the plastic i know it's bad but i took the plastic straw mm -hmm. and the woman said you are evil and i was like <gasps> i know i know this is bad i know i should be taking the paper straw and i said but i promise you in other ways, I will offset. <laughs> yeah. I will 
work to offset this. <laughs> so yeah, if it, you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater, you if, yeah. if you take the plane, you just have to then yes. Do whatever. And all day long, we're always making those choices, right? But if at the end of the day, you can live with the decisions that you're making, you know, that's fantastic. But if there's any part of you that's like, oh, I wonder if, you know, I could try this or I could do that or I could give my money to this company instead of that company. You know, I think any any little bit helps. And I, I'm, I applaud anybody at any level of any... <laughs> <laughs> anything that they can do because I think that it, it can be very overwhelming and it can be very exclusionary as well and it can seem inaccessible um I always say you know my grandparents were very sustainable because they were always so thrifty you know like they didn't even have a dryer they just hung up all their clothes all the time which again was more out of thriftiness than sustainability though you know they composted they had their own garden and now it's like trendy to have all that kind of stuff now it's um it's God, you know what gets people do it then trend away yeah do it it's fine <laughs> all right well i will see it have a wonderful time in italy Thank and you. i guess my my big um thought coming out of this is that you are one of those rare people who in addition to doing beautiful things just like you were saying about buying beautiful furniture that you know that you can feel good about people can feel good about working with you because in addition to beautiful things, they're getting thoughtfulness. They're getting, they're getting somebody who gives a hoot. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, I appreciate that you had me on and I appreciate again, like the nice at gala was fantastic. You've been so warm and welcoming your, your positivity and you, you radiate um, welcoming and uh, kindness. So in thank at in home. <laughs> That's but fine. We all do our little bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been lovely. I hope to see you soon and safe travels. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.